How are our institutions present in their places? How do we relate to our surrounding communities? There are many dimensions to such a question. Colleges and universities contribute to their local communities by providing jobs, economic stimulus, community extension, even volunteering. These are all tremendously important. There are, however, deeper questions of place, more fundamental to higher education. How do our institutions locate their academic work within their place? A Padurai has spoken of the right to research as a necessary human right in an era when economic and social changes become so rapid as to render traditional cultural resources inadequate for guiding the lives of communities. That's a profoundly interesting argument, right? That culture can't cut it anymore because parents can't really tell their kids how they ought to grow up because it's different. And so we need something like the fruits of research, ongoing dynamic creation of knowledge to respond to situations. But the question is, are our universities in places in a way that lets them provide the research their communities need? How do we bring our intellectual resources to bear on the questions faced by communities in which we're located? How do we as scholars within our institutions and communities allow our research agendas to be set by our location? As academics, we are a very specific kind of cosmopolitan, right? Who have networks that transcend space in very important ways. How do we convey understanding and appreciation, concern for the predicaments of our local places to our students? Do we share with them the full and often ambivalent histories of our institutions within these places? These questions are relevant both in the classroom, in co-curricular and extracurricular activities, and in the campus form of life. The latter is an often overlooked dimension of pedagogy. How are staff from the community integrated into the life of the institution? How do institutions adapt to and ignore their environmental locations? How are students, how do students learn that they're in a particular place with certain consequences because they come here? Gretchen helpfully yesterday highlighted the um, architecture of the campus as, uh, as an enclave, as something like a cloister. And Gerardo engaged this issue as well. Uh, in the lunch conversation, uh, someone noted that much of the contemporary language about formation and values of students uh, depends upon active engagement in the community. It's not so much that we bring them to our institutions and cloister them away and inculcate something in them. We have a praxis-oriented understanding of communicating values, right? We want them to do things in the community where they learn and engage in the community how to be what we stand for at the institution. I thought that was very much worth mentioning in terms of space. Which brings us to the third set of questions. How are our schools, how are our schools placed themselves? During the discussions and debates that accompanied the implementation of Ex Cordia Ecclesia, John Paul II's Apostolic Constitution on Catholic Universities, I often heard, and as for those of you at Catholic universities also heard, uh, the university described as a place of free inquiry and lively academic debate. And I fully support that ideal. I long for it. <laughs> <laughs> at one point during the extended discussions, though, it hit me very, very hard that I've been in university since I was 17 years old, and I've almost never seen that. Most of our work in the academy, at least in the humanities, is done alone or between professor and students. We seldom practice the lively and conflictual interchange of ideas across disciplines that we so commonly espouse. As near as I can tell, the closest we come to it, at least in, in my experience, and I, I would love to hear that this is not the case, um, is through our students. It's sort of like a dysfunctional family, right? The parents <laughs> tell, you know, say what's true, and then those people over there, you know. So, um, <laughs> they shuttle between classrooms, where, to be a bit flipped, on one side of the campus, economics faculty inculcate the students in the calculative ethos of homo economicus, and on the other side, uh, a glorious coalition, or a fractious and riven humanities faculty, <laughs> arrayed from the far left to the far right in ways that are utterly outside of the political bounds of American society, <laughs> struggle to persuade students otherwise, right? while disagreeing with each other completely. 
Our primary intellectual interlocutors tend to be other scholars in our own disciplines and subfields. And there we do have by the debate. Right? This is particularly unfortunate given the increasing heterogenization of culture around us. If we wish to instill in our students the habits of attending to different opinions and engaging others across cultural difference, we must take care to make sure to model those practices for them ourselves in these spaces. The university is a place apart. We need to practice that publicly. Show that far now. This is all the more pressing at a time when our students come from backgrounds in homogenous suburban lifestyle enclaves uh, and have grown up with the ability to tune out of uncomfortable situations by surfing the web or texting a friend or doing both at once. Now, so how do we model staying with others? And how do we model staying with place when that becomes uncomfortable? At a time where, again, for the first time in history, as I say to my students sometimes, when I was in calculus four, right, if I wanted to leave that class, I had to engage in fantasy while still staring at the board, right, in the mouth area. Like, oh. <laughs> Religiously affiliated colleges and universities have much to offer in this regard. They provide places that are both rooted in a particular communal history and that aspire to proceed according to particular dogmatic commitments, values, and practices. They can model the richness that is found in shared traditions and demonstrate the trade-offs necessary to remain faithful to convictions and values. And this, I think, is particularly important because we are in global space as well, but we make decisions about how our campuses are run, how we educate, how we relate to one another, uh, that constitutes responsibility, right? To show that there are trade-offs, right? Uh, we might not be able to hire the most important faculty in a certain field because we don't have the money for that because we actually pay a living wage to our groundskeepers, or something like that, right? To show that, 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 that beliefs actually have consequences, and you can't have it all. That physical plant, that life form of life on campus, is an enormous part of education. <coughs> Colleges and universities can model political engagement in another important manner. They're one of the few places remaining where the majority of stakeholders and decision makers are held together in one space, one place. Students, faculty, office, housekeeping, food service, maintenance staff, and administration share everyday life on the campus. That is, I think, an often overlooked facilitator of student activism. The Living Wage Campaign for Contract Wage Employees at Georgetown University exemplified this spatial intimacy. Activist students befriending, befriended the housekeepers, housekeeping staff through English lessons they were offering before and after work hours. In the context of those conversations and interactions, they learned that they did not work for the university, but an outside contractor who played very low wages in DC. Minimum wage is really below poverty there in a profound way, and did not provide health benefits. One student took an independent study in living wage issues from an economics professor. The knowledge was there, right? She was able to engage it. They prepared a proposal and pre presented it to the administration. When the response was somewhat muted, <laughs> <laughs> They began a campaign to convince students, faculty, and staff of the importance of the issue. And we were all there together, right? Faculty who they engaged, who the politics they shared, they suddenly got called, right? Got a social teaching, dude. <laughs> <laughs> And the administration left a few presentations to the, the board trustees. So there are good things here. Uh, presentations, protests, and eventually a uh, hunger strike. After three years of the campaign, the administration agreed to their demands for a policy that specified living wage and benefits in the contracts for all outside contractors, for their employees. Campus's rare spatial concentration of stakeholders can provide a place for practices of a politics of responsibility in a true politics of engagement, right? You need to actually convince other stakeholders. You need to convince the faculty to join you. You need to speak in a way that the vice president of operations can understand. You need to speak in a way that can have all these other students here uh, at a rather upper class university to get them engaged, right? Those politics of the, the rhetoric and the engagement that's necessary. All of that is enormously powerful moments of training and it can also provide a contrastive insight into the distancing 
and the separation of stakeholders and consequences that obtains outside of the university setting. Finally, what intellectual skills do our students require to live responsibly in global space? Short of a core requirement in critical geography, which I don't think would be a bad thing, but I know the line is long to add things, we need to think about incorporating spatial questions into our disciplines, as we have in the past incorporated and continue to do historical, cultural, and gender questions across the disciplines. Just as those sets of critical questions have broad purchase, so do spatial questions. So, <clears throat> when we are doing literary texts, right, what sort of spatial world do these describe? How do people come and interact with one another in these texts? What sort of ideals do they propose there? When we're doing political theory, right, where did this happen on the ground? What did the space actually look like? When we're doing theology, we're talking about these ideals, right? What did the monastery look like? What did everyday life look like in this church? Who got to speak? Who got to go where? How did that really relate to the public square, right? Where, where, where are these spaces? In addition to the various questions I've raised about education and formation on our campuses, we should also consider how our programs for study abroad function. What criteria do we use for selecting partner institutions? Do our offerings map to the same network of global cities that dominate the globalization we currently have? Or do they trace out other histories and geographies? Are students exposed to the breadth of local culture in their study there? Do they learn of the contemporary transformations of these societies in addition to the histories of the learned cultures and fine arts? And here, religiously affiliated institutions have a profound strength. They are part of global networks of sister institutions in their denominations or sponsoring religious communities. And these networks trace out different and older channels of globalization that are inflected with different values, with the convictions, values, and the practices of the religious tradition itself. Students and faculty of changes within, with sister institutions do more than expose students to different cultures. They implicate them in a different form of globalization. Now, often enough, these institutions have complex histories of intercultural encounter. Again, this is not simply a matter of there was once a good world that got messed up, right? The global network of Catholic colleges and universities is implicated in all sorts of colonial things that are just awful. And very good, too. But even for their dark side, these religious communities generally have a memory of what happened. And some attempt to atone for the, different, the dark spots of that, right? The memory of that complexity is taken care of, and they're often trying to address that in more positive forms of enculturation in the present moment. You get a very different kind of globalization in those networks, a profound resource. So to conclude, we're in the midst of a shift in the nature of human space that I think is, I'm not exaggerating to say, is every bit as epical as the emergence of the modern nation state. It has already produced disorientation and crisis for many, and the comparison with the nation state suggests that it will continue to unfold over centuries, and that much more substantial crises are likely on the way. As in, pro as in previous ethical changes, higher education will undergo profound transformation along with it. The spatial changes cut to the heart of our assumptions about how education and society hold together. Together with our students, we face the challenge of figuring out how to reconfigure them for the new form of space that is emerging around us. And those of us committed to religious forms of higher education, also in the Christian context, are participating in the ongoing unfolding of the world and have criteria and an eschatological vision for what the end result should be. So as daunting and perhaps pessimistic as this account I, I presented, right, this transformation is capable is of enormously positive outcomes. And that might be our deepest vocation uh, in this age. Thank you so much.